traveled so many places in my life and time. I've sung a lot of songs. I've made some bad ones. I've acted out my life in stages with ten thousand people watching. But we're alone now, and I'm singing the song to you. Hello, my name is John Harley. I was born in New York City in a little small place called Harlem, New York. My father's name was John Harley. He was born in Bennettsville, South Carolina. My mother was born in a little island called St. Kitts in the West Indies. They met. In Montreal, Canada, when he was playing in the big bands during the 30s, moved back to New York, and we moved into a place in Harlem called Sugar Hill. That was where all your big band leaders lived, like Ellington, uh, Count Basie, Billy Holiday, Jackie Robertson. Life was good. It was at the end of Prohibition, the beginning of the Second World War, my mother and father broke up. We moved to St. Nicholas Place in one room. That's where my story begins. After my uh, mother and father split up and we were living in a room in Harlem, we were getting older, so my mother decided to move to the Bronx, the South Bronx, because she had found an apartment there. Their life kind of stabilized itself just a little bit, but as I was getting older, I, I had a desire to uh, have more uh, acceptance from my peer group, so I started doing little funny things like uh, stealing candy and things of that nature that would, uh, would have elevated me to something that uh, wouldn't have been a, a good place to end up. So I decided at that particular point that maybe it would be good for me to go into the Air Force. <laughs> Are the stars out tonight? Even though my actual job in the Air Force was a jet uh, aircraft mechanic, I became so good at singing, and at that particular time, doo-wops were very big on the American scene. And my group called the Montclairs, we competed to the point where we were so good and we would win every contest, we became uh, TDY, what they call temporary duty assignment, to just sing all over the, air, the country and the world at various Air Force bases entertaining the troops. So when we got back to uh, our home base, I was shipped to Valdosta, Georgia with my group back in 1957. And at that particular time, since we were so good, the base commander wanted us to come sing at his house. All right, we thought, hey, we, we can get some perks from that. And when we went to his house on that Sunday afternoon, we walked up on the porch and they didn't allow us to come in the house. They had us sing on the porch and they opened up the windows and all the people, the guests of the house were looking through the windows, so we had to sing through the windows to, uh, to his guests. And I thought that was kind of odd, but that was when we were hitting Jim Crow face up, straight up, and uh, that was the wall. That was my first hard introduction into that Jim Crow area. Then we would win various contests. At one time, the group was so good, we competed uh, in Newark, New Jersey, and actually, this is back in the early days now, and we actually came in first prize, got a recording contract, and one of the groups that we beat at the time was the Manhattans. That's when they were really good at that particular time. Now, in my singing career, we had to go get some new suits, so I had gone into Valdosta, broad daylight, and uh, was coming back to my base and standing on the corner waiting for a ride back, and I saw this image of the Ku Klux Klan. 
Now, we were in Valdosta, Georgia. This is 1957, mind you. And uh, we were going to pick up some uniforms to do a tour. And we, were, we got some wine. We had just gotten paid, so we got a little bit of wine called Bojangles. And we were standing on the corner uh, trying to get a ride back to the base. And I happened to look at my friend's face, and he indicated, check this out. Look over here. And when I looked over uh, his shoulder, there was two gentlemen standing there in Klan uniforms. This is broad daylight. And at that particular time, they had their hats off laying on the back side of a convertible 1957 uh, Chevy. And uh, so my friend Nate, who was one of the singers of the group, said to me, hey, let's get that trophy. And, uh, and whoever grabs it, I'll give them five dollars and they can drink the rest of the wine. And me, I was always looking for peer approval, so I jumped, I grabbed the, uh, the bottle of wine, I grabbed the hat from the Klan, and I started to run, and the Klan started chasing me. They were pulling up the roads, and we were running down the street in broad daylight. I'm in the middle of the street, just running as fast as I can, and all of a sudden I heard something go BAM! So, sounded like a gun to me. So what had happened, as I looked over my shoulder, the Klan had a pistol, but he dropped it, and the gun went off. I panicked. Because when I heard that gunshot, I turned left and I went into the back of somebody's house. It was chicken coops back then. And I'm talking about chicken coops with all their droppings on the ground. And I just started crawling through all those droppings. And, and there were barbed wires and so forth. I don't know how I got away, but all I know, I went straight ahead. So got back to the base. Everybody was laughing at what happened. And they started telling me, you know what you just did? That was the Klan. You know who the Klan is? And they started to educate me on who the Klan was. And at, the, at that particular time, I decided maybe I might not go back to Valdosta for a while. So a friend of mine came to me and he showed me this picture of four girls, four beautiful girls. I said, where are these four beautiful girls? He said, they're up in my little town that I grew up in called Fitzgerald. I said, well, maybe that's the place I need to go hang out. So I decided to go there and not go back to Valdosta because I was a little apprehensive about going back uh, and running into that Klan group again. So when he took me up to Fitzgerald, Georgia, I saw one of the girls in the picture who looked like my girlfriend at home. So I kind of focused on her. And uh, her name was Wanda. And, uh, and I saw them in the gym. They were playing basketball. Keep in mind, I was 19. These young girls were in high school. So. I met them and decided to uh, focus on Wanda and have a conversation with her, but after the game, everybody went home. So I decided to go back up to Fitzgerald, and when I went back up to Fitzgerald, I went to this little place called the Melody Inn, a little juke joint where all the young people hang out. And I saw Ann, and I asked her, where's Wanda? She says, oh, she's with her boyfriend. She put a lot of emphasis on that. So she was there, so we would listen to the music in the juke joint. And there was a song called Maybe by the Chantel from that day, and she asked uh, me to dance. And we danced, and we had a good conversation, and the vibe was really, really uh, good. So I started to focus on Ann and didn't think about one. So after the conversation was over, it was time for me to go back to the base. And when I went to the base, I made a decision to come back to Fitzgerald by myself and to meet her mother. And uh, that's when all hell broke loose. The day that I decided to go back up to Fitzgerald, I borrowed a friend's car, which was a red 1953 Mercury with Kentucky plates, and I had an expired flower license. That's when I ran into Jim Crow all the way. It's Sunday morning. And I'm running a little late, so I figured I'd jump into the car and head up to uh, Fitzgerald to go to church to meet uh, Ann's mother. So I'm in the car, so I'm speeding a little bit, and I come through this little town called Osceola, Georgia, which was nine miles from Fitzgerald. And I was doing about 50 miles an hour in a 35-mile zone, and then I looked in the rearview mirror, there was a siren, and there it was. Uh, a policeman pulled me over. And it was typical of the Southern policeman at the time, a, 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 a kind of heavy set guy. His, his stomach was hanging over underneath the, 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 the gun belt. You know, he had a cowboy hat kicked back on his head. He had his sunglasses on. And he looked at me and said, boy, you in trouble. Now, I had my Air Force uniform on, 
and I kept looking at my watch because I was late for church. He says, you ain't going nowhere. And uh, he made a radio call. The next thing I know, another cop pulled up, and they got behind me. And they said to me, you got to go see the you got to go see the sheriff. You got to go see the, uh, the judge on a Sunday morning. And that's when they took me to the judge's house. And they said, we can't put him in the lockup because it's full from all the people that we put in on Friday night. So we got to put him in the outhouse. All right. They took me to the back of the Justice of Peace's house, put me in an outhouse in the summer. And I'm standing over a hole with two cinder blocks and two two by fours in an outhouse and you can almost see the stink and the green flies <laughs> that were flying around and I kept sticking my nose through this half moon trying to get some air. And I stayed in that outhouse for two and a half hours until the Justice of Peace came out of the church, asked me, uh, Boy, how much money do you have on you? And I told him $12. He said, that's your fine. I got in the car. I raced into Fitzgerald, saw my mother-in-law, or my potential mother-in-law, Ann's mother, and Ann, and I told them about the incident, and they laughed. And they says, that's just the way it is. You're in the South. What I'd like people to really understand about this book, which is called Bronx Rhythms and Jim Crow Blues, it's my understanding as a young man, I had very low self-esteem, but yet I did a lot of things to get peer approval. So when I went south for the first time, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't have low self-esteem because of my artistic uh, work that I did in show business, but being a showman, being a singer, that gave me more self-esteem. People looked at the artistry of myself and not from, wh from whence I came. Uh, when I met my wife, Anne, uh, at the time, she was in college. That's where we got married. We eloped when she was in college. And what I'm trying to get across uh, to people is the fact that this is a love story, okay, and the way things came together, uh, I had no control over the Klan chasing me out of Valdosta, Georgia, but inadvertently they led me to my wife up in Fitzgerald. But when we got married and uh, moved to the North, we were married for 15 years, but we had nothing but pure harmony all that time. We had two sons out of the marriage. And what people needed to know is that everything we did, when I did got professional in my show business, I became an artist, I recorded, and, and uh, anytime I went to a gig uh, to do a show, my wife was there. And uh, she would always give me, you know, approval by the wink of an eye or maybe a glimpse if I kind of did something wrong. But everything we did with our children, everything we did with our friends, everything we did, we did together. Sort of, she gave me a balance in life. She gave me a focus in life. And it was just so happened that ironically, in, in the year 1973, two days before Christmas, I found my wife dead. From, from an aneurysm. And uh, I think at that time, I wanted to put everything into a book because today as we talk, look at life, people don't live in one location, they live all over the world. And that experience in my life changed my life. It made me a better person. It made me focus on some of the things I do with young kids today, grandkids and so forth. It all started when I met Anne.